So let's uh, let's continue the discussion of sexist uh, appearances. Uh, chapter ten: Does the do the skeptics abolish appearances? Sexist says no. They don't abolish the appearances. They don't deny that certain things appear to them in a certain way at a certain time. What do they deny? He says in that chapter, chapter 10, we do not overthrow the affective sense impressions which induce our assent involuntarily. And these impressions are the appearances. Um, I do not deny at any one moment that I am hungry, uh, that I am experiencing a sensation of hunger that that demands my assent involuntarily. I cannot deny it, actually. I cannot deny that I am seeing an image of myself or that I uh, an image of myself appears to me right now on uh, the computer that I'm looking at. Uh, those things uh, uh, definitely do to appear to me, and I can't seem to deny them. So we do not abolish appearances. We do not say, he says, we skeptics, that things do not appear in a certain way to a certain person at a certain time in a certain way, but what is denied? He continues, and when we question whether the underlying object is such as it appears, we grant the fact that it appears, and our doubt does not concern the appearance itself, but the account given of the appearance, and that is a different thing from questioning the appearance itself. So skepticism seems to have to do with accounts, with arguments, with justifications. With, and with the judgments that are based upon those, if I, as I said before, if I describe an appearance that I am experiencing, something that appears to me to be so, I am on safe ground in simply describing it as an appearance. But once I start to make judgments about how that appearance relates to a so-called external reality, that's when I can get in trouble, because that's when I start to... I guess dogmatized because I start to make statements about things that are non-evident to me, and I guess I shouldn't do that. And that brings us to this notion of mental suspense, as it is in this translation. Usually you'll see the term suspension of judgment, but it's the idea of suspense. The Greek is epoche, and it's uh, similar to a word that's used in ancient astronomy when uh, an ancient astronomer, who of course presuppose that the Earth was at rest and that the heavenly bodies, the stars, the sun, the planets were in motion around the Earth. When an ancient astronomer was uh, ch charting, following the orbit of a heavenly body night by night in, in the sky, uh, he would find, or she would find, that uh, sometimes uh, it would appear to stop. That is, the motion would, would stop, sometimes it would even go back. But that stop, the epoch, I believe, uh, something to do with that. Uh, that, that stop in the motion, and then it would go on. This was a problem, of course, for ancient astronomy, again, caused by the fact that they assumed that the Earth was at rest and that everything was in motion around the Earth. Uh, it was a strange thing, and it had to be accounted for, and all sorts of mathematics were developed to account for that in a very interesting way. But just as the planet, in the course of its orbit, stops, we stop. When we realize, he says, that uh, every statement can be opposed to every other statement, that no argument is certain about the world, and that any judgment we make about the nature of external reality can be opposed by a, a, a contradicting judgment of equal validity, so we stop. We hold ourselves in suspense. And that's the first criterion of the two senses of the word criterion that he's describing in chapter 11. The word criterion, he says, is used in two senses. In the one, it means, quote, the standard regulating belief in reality or unreality, and this we shall discuss in our refutation. In the other, and this is the one that has to do with the suspension of judgment, it denotes the standard of action by conforming to which, in the conduct of life, we perform some actions and abstain from others, and it is of the latter that we are now speaking. Uh, the idea of the suspension of judgment as criterion is that if we realize, if we clear up our confusions about what we really know and realize that we don't really know anything, at least about the world in some way transcendent of the appearances that, that we have, and that if we realize there, our inability to say anything meaningful, anything true about those things, 
Demir led to a state of mind which he calls peace or tranquility. We no longer um, trouble ourselves about the true nature of the world because we realize that we can't know a thing about it. So we suspend our judgment and uh, we cease to, or at least try, to cease to be moved by the things of the world, the appearance, because they are mere appearances. We don't know what the way the world actually is. We don't know whether it's good or bad. We don't know about those things. So really, it's not worth getting riled up about because we're in a position of ignorance. Uh, the, the criteria then by which we live, uh, it's, the suspension of judgment leads to tranquility or peace. And then, and then, well, you know, and it goes on, it goes, you know, how do we live? Um, you know, we, we can't just sort of stop living, even though we don't know anything about the world, even though we can't find the truth about the world or even about ourselves. And then, you know, there are certain rules, you know, guidance of nature, uh, restraint, uh, constraint of the passions, tradition of laws and customs, instruction of the arts. That is, you don't really know the truth. If you're skeptic, you don't really know the truth. For instance, about what is the good or how we should live or how we should treat others. All of those things concern external realities of which I cannot make any kind of sensible judgment. On the other hand, I've got to live. So you might as well just sort of follow the customs of your country, follow the natural desires of your body. Um, he mentions the instruction of the arts. Uh, well, we don't know if the arts really get truth, but they seem to work sometimes. Like I, There is a lot of speculation that Sextus was a physician, and there is a very close connection between certain schools of philosophy, especially skepticism, uh, and uh, ancient medicine. And one can see how that fits into the instruction of the arts. Sort of empiricism and that sort of non-dogmatizing tradition is very important in the history of medicine, especially ancient medicine and modern medicine too. It's what happened in between that some doctors would say was a big failure of medicine. So the end of this in chapter 12, he says, the end is quietude, tranquility, moderation. So that's one sense of the word criterion, the criterion by which we live. Suspension of judgment, and, and then just sort of following convention, training passion, instruction of the arts, etc. There is another sense of criterion, too. I mean, a very important epistemological sense of criterion, which is frankly more important for us. And, and that is uh, the first one he mentioned, uh, the standard regulating belief in reality or unreality. In, in a way, skepticism as a philosophical inquiry is a continual inquiry into what the criterion is by which we would judge that something is true. Criterion in the sense of standard. Criterion, again, in the sense of that which we can refer to to decide whether anything is true or false. One may say that that's exactly what Plato was looking for, or Socrates was looking for, in the Mino. What is the criterion by which we would judge that any particular human act or human characteristic was in fact virtue, well, the criterion would be the form of virtue itself. That is the only way we would know, for instance, that any one of the examples that Mino gives in the beginning of that dialogue of, of virtue is really an example of virtue, is if we could refer to the example to a standard virtue in itself, what virtue is, and that would be the criterion by which we judge whether his judgment of any particular example was actually true or whether it was false. And it is this uh, that's actually more interesting philosophically for us. The other sense of criterion is very interesting, I would say, ethically, and very important ethically. Uh, it's very closely related to a school of philosophy, which is very, very influential in the ancient world called Stoicism. But that was more or less primarily a, an ethical philosophy, philosophy of life. And that's an important part, certainly, of skepticism, too. But, but skepticism, as we're looking at it, is more important in terms of epistemological maybe even metaphysical uh, characteristics in terms of possibilities, this sort of line of inquiry we're following about out, about inquiry itself. So uh, really, it is the search for the criterion. How, on, on what standard will we be able to judge that anything is true or false, which is a, you know, kind of like the, the central point here. Is there such a criterion? So let's look a little further into this, and especially into the direct relevance for the things that we read in Aristotle.